penitentiary designed for solitary confinement. About 80,000 men and women were incarcerated in this building over the course of a 142 year consecutive history. It didn't close until 1971 when the last person was transferred out. The building was abandoned, it was slated for demolition. Uh, at one point, it looked almost like a, like a Mayan ruin here uh, in the heart of center city of Philadelphia. Um, but eventually, we did open a museum. The museum opened in 1994. Most of our visitors today take an audio tour. We are increasingly interested, though, in discussing issues close. We believe that uh, criminal justice reform is the civil rights issue of our generation, and we take that responsibility very seriously here at Eastern State. We hire people who've been incarcerated onto our tour program. We don't advertise this very much because we, um, we just don't think that it's, it's appropriate, but there are people uh, on our interpretive team who've been incarcerated. We work with a lot of artists, uh, many of whom these days have also been incarcerated. This is um, Jesse Crimes' piece, um, which uh, he created while he was incarcerated in federal prison. We have three new art installations that just opened last week. We happy to show this to you on another occasion, which tonight's not tonight. We built this giant graph showing the rate of incarceration in U.S. history. Uh, it opened in, in 2014, and a companion exhibit in 2016 called Prisons Today, which won a bunch of awards, and we're very proud of it as well. We're also very proud that even as we've asked our visitors to consider some more and more complicated subject matter, our attendance has continued to thrive. Our attendance is now four times higher than it was 10 years ago, even as we've begun to ask visitors to consider some really troubling aspects of the criminal justice system in the United States today. Our current project is called Hidden Lives Illuminated. We have been, it's a three year project coming to a close now. We've been teaching animation and narration and, um, and story writing to people who are incarcerated, to artists who are currently incarcerated. All of our students have made films about their lives uh, and we're gonna project those films over the front wall of Eastern State Penitentiary this summer. It opens on August 15th, runs for 29 consecutive nights, uh, films by people who are currently incarcerated we're also working on a, um, on a visitor center, uh, which will be in the front area of the, of the uh, building. We're gonna break ground on that in November, so stay tuned for that. We have a very active membership program. Anyone here members? Raise your hand if you're a member. I'm a member. Uh, thank you. Our members, our members make all sorts of things possible, including this speaker series, which remains free. So thank you to our members. Uh, Joel is here from our membership, from our advancement team. They can tell you more about that program. Um, after the presentation tonight, if you are interested in joining up and being a member. This is the Searchlight Series. The Searchlight Series is always the first Tuesday of the month. It's always at 6 p.m. It's always free. It always involves, uh, we always bring people to discuss some aspect of the criminal justice system today. So you're in the right spot. We really do read those surveys. If there was one, we handed one on the way in. Uh, we read them and we select future speakers based on uh, the opinions of people in the room. So please do let us know. Uh, you can also sign up for the Searchlight mailing list on that as well. Next month, we have an old friend, Ann Parsons. Um, I've known Ann for many years. She has a new book out. It's called Decarcerating America, Efforts to Close Mental Hospitals and Prisons. That is the June Searchlight speaking series uh, speaker. She's going to be great. But tonight, we have another old friend, Johnny Perez. Um, uh, Johnny Perez is the director of U.S. Prison Programs for the National Religious Campaign Against Torture an organization committed to ending practices it deems cruel, inhumane, and degrading, including solitary confinement. He works to empower faith leaders and directly impacted communities to engage in advocacy for criminal justice reform. However, it turns out that Johnny's driving down from Albany, where he is. Johnny's here! <laughs> Johnny's here! <laughs> Johnny's, Johnny's uh, become a personal friend, an old friend of the project. Uh, Ron was ready to pinch it for you. I'm glad though that you're here. Uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Johnny Perez. <laughs> good, good, good. And I'm glad my supervisor was there to pinch me. That's what I'm talking about, teamwork. You know, I tell you. First of all, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'll just, uh, so, so thank you so much for coming. Um, it was Tuesday, it's, it's very, it's been a long day. I'm actually coming from Albany where we met with legislators, Albany, New York, we met with legislators trying to uh, form a piece of legislation that we have, um, which limits the amount of uh, days that people spend in solitary, who gets to go in there in the first place, um, more importantly, the, the, the correctional question, right, about, um, hey, I, um, the correctional question about like, well, what do we do with these people if we can't put them in solitary? 
um, uh, you know, the alternative. What is the alternative? And I'll tell you a peak, uh, a sneak peek is um, um, if we let everyone in solitary, guess what? The, the increases in violence, uh, there were, you won't see any increases in violence. Colorado uh, just recently, uh, not too long ago, did it and didn't see a huge spike in violence. So there's a huge misconception about who's in there, why they're there, so, um, how long they're there, so on and so forth. So I hope to try to shed light on some of that. I mean, like Sean was saying, he, he kind of rattles a lot of my professional accomplishments. But when people ask me, Johnny, how did you come to the work? I always tell people, well, um, my arrested officer brought me to the work <laughs> um, in the sense of uh, that I spent 13 years incarcerated. Uh, when I was 21, I applied a criminal solution to my problems and I robbed a convenience store. And I've been sentenced to 15 years in prison plus another five years on parole. Um, it was two days after my daughter was born. Um, so you can imagine coming home 13 years later to a a little girl who's 13 going on 50, um, <laughs> trying to navigate all of those things. But I'm going to get a little bit into that a little bit later. Um, so I talk a lot about solitary confinement. I spent three years in, in, in the box. And um, for this conversation, I thought that actually kind of changed my approach a little bit. And you know, I want to talk about solitary, but I want to talk more about our values through the lens of solitary. You know, um, because I think that allows us to kind of really understand a little bit more versus the, you know, the more technical stuff, right? This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. So on the sofa, really asking the question, the, the, the deeper question is, you know, is solitary reflective of our shared values? A, and more importantly, that question, in order for, to answer that question, we have to clarify exactly what our shared values are. You know, when I was incarcerated for, uh, for a long time, um, uh, I... I thought it was a curse at the time, but it actually came out to be a gift because I was able to, uh, I was uh, sent to about eight or nine different prisons throughout the 13 years of my incarceration. You know, all different levels of security. And, you know, although at the time, you sometimes things happen, you're like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? And then years later, you're like, wow, I'm actually glad that that happened because that gave me uh, such an expansive view um, about the system, uh, the policies that impact the folks that are there, and most importantly, like who's actually in there. Um, and I can tell you, when I was when I was when I was first sentenced, um, you know it's you know it's 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 hard to take 15 years. You know the, the judge is sitting up there, Johnny Perez. I sentenced you to 15 years to be served in a maximum state correctional facility in New York State. And at first, it doesn't necessarily click in. You're like, ah, not, they'll they'll let me go. They just they just trying to scare me. You know. Then a year passes by, two years, three years, four years, five years, six years. You know, you think that, well, actually you come to the realization that, no, there, you have to do this time, A. Uh, B, no one's going to knock on the door and say, hey, Johnny, by the way, we just messing with you, man. You can, you can leave now. <laughs> you know, and I have to really do this time. And what does that mean? You know, the deeper question about why am I here? Really, why am I here? I broke the law. That's an obvious one, Right? But what actually allowed me, gave me, or how did I give myself permission to break the law? I think that was a deeper question for me. You know, and I say solitary, um, it's a lot of time. Uh, and you get a lot of time to think. You get a lot of time to imagine. You get a lot of time to overthink. Um, you get a lot of time to sleep. Um, and when you get tired of sleeping all day, you're also up all night. You know, but you, you, you do tend to have these thoughts and, and you, and you, and you, you spend an incredible amount of time in such a deep type of introspection, but also just reflection about a number of different things. And one of the things that I reflected on was exactly what my values are. You know, Johnny, what are your values? You know, for a long time I thought that I valued family, but then my actions contradicted that. How can I value family, yet um, break the law and essentially take myself away from my family in a sense? And that's independent of how messed up the system is. This is talking about me and my own personal decisions, right? Um, and I realized that a lot of the values that I have absorbed, you know, were not really sort of like mine to begin with in a sense. I inherited them, you know, from my parents, from the people that I grew up with, you know? Um, and I found out that the things that I thought that I valued, my actions showed me that I actually did. And it was this, this um, cognitive dissonance, if you will. Oops. You, can you tell I'm not an Apple person? I have a Samsung, everything in my house. Okay. So, you know, I, I do want to set the scene because I, you know, I, it's important for me, you know, that you understand 
um, the, the emotional environment, if you will, the spiritual environment that, that, that was happening in order for me to go to a place where I was actually even thinking about values and even looking at them. And, and you know, a lot of my, my cellmates used to think that I was crazy or that I was losing it, you know, and I would really, literally, I think, I, I think about eight years in, I got to a point where I was just really literally interviewing people. You know, why'd you come back? Why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? Um, not because I, I aspired to be a researcher, but because I wanted to find out why everybody was getting locked up so I don't follow their footsteps and not come back. Um, but in this, but in this kind of like emotionally pressurized environment, if you will, um, you know, I spent a total of three years inside of in, inside of inside of this space. You know, I'm six feet tall, so if I so if I stretch both of my hands out, I can literally touch both walls. Um, I used to sleep with my, my legs tucked a lot because again, the, the bed is shorter than than, than I'm tall. Maybe it's probably like five feet long. Um, I put that 23 to 24 hours a day because. You know, we, we hear the normal 24 hours a day, but in practice, and anyone who spends time in solitary, or even in the jail setting, we know that policies and practice and policies and theory are two separate things. So paper is 23, but in practice is 24, when you find out that you have to be fully dressed, standing at your door, uh, whether it's six o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, or sometimes just be up whenever they decide to yell, hey, I'm walking, and if you caught me, you caught me, if not, then tomorrow you'll get another chance. Um, so, but in practice, a lot of men and women find themselves in, in, in isolation that's for 24 hours a day. You know, and when you look at the fact that in the winter, you're only allowed to wear one layer, and a lot of people actually refuse recreation because what am I going to do in 10 degree weather for an entire hour? Um, I might as well stay inside. So through the winter month, you see that people are actually isolated for long periods of time, for weeks at a time. Um, you know, uh, no meaningful human contact was one of the most difficult things. You know, like, you know, we, we, here we are out in the world, right? And you walk by me and you don't say nothing to me. I'm not going to get mad at you. Oh, Ron's having a bad day. You know, but when the only person who, you know, who, who you come in contact with, the person who you depend on for everything, I mean everything, everything, <laughs> toilet paper, tissue, food, conversation, even in some contexts, is eye contact, which is something that we usually don't think about, but, you know, I wrote about it at the time in my journals, and, and I've been thinking about it more and more, but the, the impact that, you know, um, the lack of eye contact has on an individual who is inside of these isolated spaces for such a long time, where the only person you come in contact with does not, at the very least, acknowledge your humanity. And that's independent of what you did to get here, you know, um, because if one thing that I know about solitary is that solitary is a prison within the prison, you know, and one of the things that I, that I tell to audiences across the country is to understand that prison is the punishment. And incarceration and, and, and solitary is a punishment on top of that. So what does that mean? That means that if I spent 13 years in prison, 13 years away from my daughter, 13 Christmases, 13 summers, 13 July 4ths, 13 Miss Thanksgivings, you know, um, all those years that she could, you know, so on and so forth, like that in itself is a punishment. And I think that other, um, other countries are, are, are better examples than we are. Uh, in, in that space. You know, we, we look at countries like Sweden, Norway, you know, when you walk inside of a cell and you, you think that you're in a college dorm when you're actually in a prison cell. Why? Because they recognize that, you know, prison is the punishment, A. B, the purpose of their prisons is to bring you back into a space where you'll be able to make better decisions, so on and so forth. In a sense, it's not punitive as, as us Americans are. We have this punitive paradigm where we see everything as a a, a nail, and, we're, and we tend to be a hammer. And if you're a hammer, you tend to see everything as a nail. Um, and solitary is sort of like that. When we respond you know, um, to cannabis use, which is the main reason why I was there for a whole of that time. Um, and, and I'll say something about that. And I, and I always say the same thing that you know, I don't promote drug use, cannabis use, X, Y, Z. But there's nothing like getting 15 years in jail that's going to make you want to smoke a joint. <laughs> and, and, and the correctional department's response, you know, is to place you inside of a space uh, 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 pretty much like the one I'm describing here. But even on top of that, not to be able to give you the programs and services that you, that you would need um, uh, uh, for drug addiction, so on and so forth. And then later on, of course, when you go to the parole board, they say, hey, why didn't you take this uh, uh, drug program? You should have took it by now. And you find out you're in solitary with his two more years, despite the fact that you didn't have no control over the program was accessible to you or not. Right. So again, I want you to ask yourself the big question about what is the purpose of solitary? 
or better yet, what is the purpose of prison? Which is a bigger question, right? And and you know what are what are what are the values in which can we can achieve that purpose? Assuming that the purpose is is is, is correct in a way. And I may not be the person to say what's correct and what's not, but I am trying to be here to kind of challenge your thinking in a sense. Some other, <laughs> some other, some other things that I really want to highlight from this list that were really a uh, uh, difficult, uh, really challenging, not only for myself but um, for a lot of people that I either did time with or now now I have met in my professional capacity going inside of these prisons and having conversations with men. Uh, I haven't been to a women's prison yet, but uh, conversations uh, with with men and and, and and the treatment they get there, um, and the lack of the lack of intellectual stimulation. Of course, you know you find yourself reading toothpaste ingredients, and I've read the, the, the dictionary about three or four times, and I always joke about reading War and Peace because it was the only book inside of the cell. Um, you know, so this that thirst for intellectual stimulation is that thirst for human contact, some type of human acknowledgement. And that in itself does have psychological ramifications. You know, in fact, there's very recent, recent studies now that have been done on lab rats. In fact, not too long ago, um, Sean, did we present, present that here? Uh, I'm not sure. the, the uh, there's, there's, been recent, there's been recent studies actually did it on, on lab rats. They actually get um, RRB uh, approval where um, some, of the, some of the preliminary results show that, that solitary actually alters your, your, your brain wiring and chemistry in a sense. You know, and, and it says a lot. You know, if we if we have, I mean, I would say we have irrefutable evidence. Um, uh, you know, um, but for those who are not convinced, if we have even more refutable evidence, we have to ask the bigger question: that if we know that we are consciously damaging people, right? Then then what do we do with that information? If the purpose of prison is to rehabilitate, if right? Why? Because we know that what ninety five percent of the people who are currently incarcerated are coming right back. You're gonna serve your food, you're gonna drive your cars. You know, you may even be working for one. <laughs> um, right? Um, you know, um, so so right, we're coming back into this community. So the question is, what kind of neighborhood do I want to have? A is the purpose of prison serving that B and is in line with our shared values. Um, and a lot of times you'll you'll reach this this cognitive dissonance in a sense. Um, and, and I like to use the word cognitive dissonance. Um, you know, I was I was really impressed by it by the first time that I actually came across it in a in a college um, in a prison college room uh, a, a, a classroom uh, with other twenty five men who were also studying psychology and, and the, this idea that you know there is this internal battle between belief and action or or how can we hold two things together and sometimes we have to change one or the two in order for us to feel at peace with ourselves and I just think about that. When, and I call him Officer Stevens. And so think about that when Officer Stevens used to give me, used to walk by every day and I come in contact with him, we go and look at him like, how, like, how does that look for you at work every day? And then of course you have a lot of time to think. So you start to think about, well, you know, how can we give ourselves permission to be able to dehumanize someone or to turn a blind eye to their plight? A and then B, you know, um, very randomly, you know, the guy who works in Texas, who works for the death penalty, who presses the syringe, like that's his job. I wonder how he wakes up every morning, knowing that today is the day I may kill someone. You know, and how does that conflict with our shared values or that individual's values? And what kind of values allow an individual to say, I'm going to kill this person? Or better yet, I'm going to place this person in such, a, um, a, in such an oppressive and depressive state that he sort of kind of like deserves it in a sense. And I did highlight some of these values, right? We, we value community and family, you know, except that, you know, um, our criminal justice system actually breaks up families, right? In a number of different ways, right? With the sentencing them to long prison terms where out, long outside of their counties. I remember my daughter's mother having to travel 10 hours uh, just to come see me for a few hours. Um, you know, here we are, we, we you, know, uh, you know, there's a lot of different prisons that are restricting in-person visits. You know, there's denials of, the denials of home addresses by parole. You know, like here it is, you grew up in this household and because you were arrested in this neighborhood now, you know, because of whatever policies, you can't go back to the, to the house that you live in, so you're forced to go into a shelter. You know, um, so how can we value community and family where you have these policies, right? And then moving forward, how can we value second chances? But yet on the other hand, 
have perpetual consequences of having a criminal record. You know, by one study, it was 47,000 collateral consequences to a criminal record. You can't possibly cop out to all those things or plead bill. Those things. In fact, you can't even possibly even foresee them in the moment, right? Um, you know, here it is, we value freedom, you know, um, but yet we, we also, again, like, you know, we, we, we further harm people with, with their mental health and so on and so forth um, uh, and re-traumatize them. And, and understanding that incarceration in itself causes trauma. And then solitary on top of that is trauma on top of trauma, um, on top of trauma, on top of trauma, on top of trauma. Um, and for the folks who are released directly from this type of space into society, you know, we have to ask the question, are we really doing the best that we can to, to, to give them the best tools that they need in order to achieve or, or to become the best version of themselves in a sense? Um, and holding these two dichotomies together, right? How can we, you know, we, we value compassion and justice, but sometimes what happens when, when, when our perception of justice, you know, um, conflicts with compassion, you know? If justice looks like 20, 30 years for, I don't know, let's take a Florida case, three strikes out, you stole the pizza, it's 20 years, right? That's justice in California, right? Versus our ideas of compassion. You know, um, our ideas of dignity that everybody uh, 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 has, uh, is born with equal worth and, and, um, and humanity, if you will, but this idea of equal opportunity, right? Like we value you, but hey, you have a chance to get everything else like everyone else. I mean, everybody in here has a chance to get a million dollar house or become president. Chances are, a lot of us, many of us won't. You know, um, equal opportunity does not equal equality, just to be clear on that. You know, how do we balance love and retribution, right? Um, how do we balance uh, humanity and our ideas about humanity with capitalism and our thirst for, for continuously profiteering? I mean, in a lot of cases, when we're talking about the system of the bodies of, of black and brown folks who, who carry the brunt of the criminal justice system and its policies. Um, so at some point, Officer Stevens said, what's your problem? Why you keep messing with me? Because at some point I said, well, you're not going to look at me. You're not going to talk to me. So I would curse him out every now and then just to get a reaction. Um, and one day he did. He gave me the best reaction. Uh, he just like, I think he was holding it in for like six months. He let me have it for like a good five minutes. Um, and I felt good. I felt acknowledged. Um, even if he was angry at me, I knew that I was an individual that he felt angry at and humans do get mad at each other. Um, I felt seen, I felt heard, you know? Um, and then the ensuing days, mind you, this is a 10 month stint, which is the longest time I spent one time in solitary. He, he, he did say, hey, you know, you have to understand, like, you know, you, um, you harm someone, you know? And, and, and that's a question that I think about and I consistently think about because we can't talk about the injustices of the system when the folks have been ensnared, who in some cases are victims themselves, right? When we see violence, we see trauma. You know, you know what if I told you that I didn't learn how to pull a gun on you until someone pulled a gun on me? You know, I started carrying a gun at 15 years old, illegally, because I come from a community who didn't trust police officers. So I said, my friend shot in front of me, so I gotta call you. You know, um, uh, with the harm, the, the real harm that I've actually caused. You know, and, and what I realized is that it's sort of similar in, in how the systems create these policies in a way in which my process that I had to take to break the law, right? Like what was my internal process when I, 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 I decided that, you know, um, I wanted to forcibly take someone's property. And in order for me to do that, I had to dehumanize an individual. I had to look at them as if they wasn't even people even worthy of even having this in some cases, even to the pro I had to uh, 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 disillusion myself. And the question that, you know, um, Officer Stevens said, well, you harm someone. It was the deeper question was he was really giving himself permission to treat me this way. See, because if I see, if I, if I see you as a person who harms someone, someone who has this, who is deserving of some type of retribution and justice, then I feel justified. In fact, I feel like it's my job and my duty. And I can't tell you how many correction officers I met. I mean, think about it, 13 years, right? Like I'll talk to you at the beginning of your job. Here it is, you're 10 years in and I'm still here. We're like buddies now. So you go through two divorces. I know what you like to eat for lunch. I probably know more about you than you know about me and, and vice versa. You know, and, and, and one common thing that I did see is that a lot of correction officers would justify their behavior, which in other contexts would even warrant imprisonment in itself. You know, um, with this idea that 
you deserve to get treated like this because you broke the law. And how is that different from other countries who say, hey, wow, you don't deserve to do this. If you broke the law, let me give you a hug because you obviously need it and we can hold you accountable because accountability is a real thing. We just can't have a society of people just running around without accountability. And that's just real. You know, I've definitely sat across some people and I'm like, I do not, you, like, you need to take a time out. You know, um, so we do have to have accountability, but but not at the cost of undermining our humanity. Does that make sense? We can hold people accountable, but not hold, but not treat them inhumane in the process. If my daughter comes home tonight, you know, um, on a high of weed, for you know, to use my own example, you know, I'm not going to stuff her in the closet for a year, <laughs> right, and feed her three meals a day, the last meal at four o'clock, windowless closet. Uh, don't look at her, don't talk to her, don't acknowledge her. That sounds like child welfare, child neglect. It sounds like a few felonies in there. And I already have a record, so I'll be doing all of that time. But yet, we give ourselves permission to do that legally. How is that possible? You know, the other day, an article came out, and I'm kind of hearing off the script, but, you know, these correction officers were arrested for, illegal, for um, conducting illegal cavity and body searches. You know, um, and it made me think about all of the times that my daughter visited and because my daughter's mother was, you know, like whatever their policy was, um, uh, my daughter at this time was forced to take her diapers off to see to make sure that there was nothing smuggled in there. Think about that. What I'm saying is that my daughter was strip searched before she was able to walk because her only crime was that she was born to a father who made shitty decisions. And that is the type of system that we have that sometimes it gets lost inside of these conversations about, I mean, I can see you guys' faces. Like, well, I would never do that. But yet, and I'll tell you, I just came, <laughs> I'll tell you these politicians, <laughs> um, And with respect to the legislators who support your movement, but hey, y'all know how y'all how do. Um, you know, this, this, you know, this, um, uh, um, <sighs> damn, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, this idea of giving, giving ourselves permission, so on and so forth. Yeah, okay, yeah. So missing missing the missing those layers that we don't often peel back. That we often just look at the individual and say, wow, well, you know something? Well, that'll never happen to me because I'll never do that. Or I remember I tell you how many times of course also said if you don't, if you can't do the time, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except how do I tell that to somebody completely proud? Who was wrongfully convicted of a crime that he did not commit? excuse me, wrongfully accused and arrested of a crime that he did not commit, spent two years in solitary, in solitary, three years total, and then one day the DA says, hey, man, we messed up. Man, you got the wrong guy. You can leave now. And he's like, hey, I'm 18 years old. I've been here since I was 15, 16 years old. I forgot my, I missed my crime. My girlfriend left me, right? I, I don't feel right in the head, in a sense, and, and that's sort of like some of his words, you know? Um, and then, and then, and then commit suicide. And then, a mother, and then a year later, his mother literally dies from a broken heart. You know, so it's like, I get it. Don't do the crime, don't do the time. But how do I explain that to someone like him? Right? And if we understand that people can get instilled in the system, do we, do we create an, a blanket and just capture everyone? It's like, hey, well, just, uh, just a, a, a collateral consequence, if you will. You know, or do we, do, do we or are we more conscious about who, who are, who's in there how they get in there, right? And more importantly, um, how do we keep them from, from, from coming back? And I always use Alfred Wolfox's example because here's a man, right? I mean, I, I, was, in, I was in solitary for like very minor things, you know, but, you know, uh, uh, Albert, he, he landed in solitary, you know, I mean, he was involved in a situation where Carson also lost their life, you know, and that Carson also never get his life back, you know? And the state's response was to literally incarcerate him again inside of the incarceration for 44 years. You know, um, and I hope to meet him one day. And, and Sean, if you haven't had him here, you totally have to have him and invite me because I want to listen. Um, but, you know, like at what point does the punishment become worse than the actual, well, just as bad or if worse than, than the actual crime in a sense? You know, and, and if so, then at what point do we have these diminishing returns, if you will? You know? Um, Dehumanization, this is actually, uh, I didn't put it in, but this is actually my colleague, uh, Laura Downton, who is uh, our campaign strategist. 
um, and actually uh, one of the most wonderful folks who I've met. And actually took her, I stepped into her role and then she's still with us. Um, but no more do you see this dehumanization and the architecture and the language and the commodification um, of convicted people. And when you look at the architecture, right, these small cells, small windowless drag colors, I can't tell you the first time that I, I was actually like let out of the cell and then even into general population when you see colors that you don't see inside of isolation, they're very bright. You tend to look at them a lot because they seem also like, uh, 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 it's like your senses are, are heightened in a sense. You know, um, very bright colors. Some colors you don't even gonna see in prison at all until you get released. You're like, wow, it's been a while since I've actually seen that color, like orange and blue in some states, depending on whatever the question officer is wearing. You know, um, you know, the constant light stays on. I know a lot, I know many people who actually, uh, their eyes have been damaged. You know, to this day I wear glasses, I don't have them now, I lost them. Um, but think about it, right? You're sitting 10 months in a six by nine cell, right? Windowless in some cases, or, or in one cruel example, I had a window, but when you open the window, it's facing a brick wall. I don't know which one's worse. <laughs> but, you're, but you really can't really see them more than eight feet in front of you, right? And mine, the longest thing was 10 months, you know? But I know people who spent five, 10, 15 years in those settings. I mean, Alpha Wolf, I spent 44 years in those settings. And what does that do to what does that do to our vision, right? What does that do to our self-talk? A, a lot of other things. Um, so being being conscious of that architecture say, well, you don't deserve a window. You don't deserve direct sunlight. You know, you don't deserve to stand on your feet when you get your food. Some 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 prisons and some cells, the slot uh, in which they open to give you food is so low that you literally even have to bend down. In some cases, if you if the nurse comes to take blood, you literally have to get on your knees. Um, I know that's true because I've had to get on my knees to get like a TB test, get blood taken and stuff like that, um, because it's just impractical to do that. The, you know, the dehumanization of it all. We see it in the language, right? Both outside in the world and inside of prison, right? This conversation about, you know, convict, right? Um, how many bodies do you have? You know, I, I have 50 heads for you. You know, um, inmate, you're no longer, your name is no longer Johnny Perez. Your name is now inmate number 0185068, which, I sometimes play as my lotto number. Um, <laughs> that is real talk. I think anyone who's ever been born incarcerated paid the numbers. Um, and I'll keep playing. Um, you know, we hear this conversation about, you know, you're an ex-con, this prisoner, right? And, and, I, and like I mentioned the last time that I was here, that until we see people as people, we won't treat them as such, you know? Um, and, you know, with respect to, you know, um, World War II, right? One of the things that I learned throughout that time, actually from reading uh, Victor Frankl's book, A Message for Meaning, if you've never read it, read it, it's the best 68 or about 100 pages I've ever read. And, you know, um, in order for us to give permissions for us to really literally harm and oppress an entire group of people, entire class of people, not because of what they've done, but because of who they are, again, we had to give ourselves permission. You see some of that language changing during those times, right? Whether it was through textbook, through it was the news media, so on and so forth. Um, because we tend to we tend to internalize a lot of the language that's actually told to us, and you don't have to go that far. I mean, you can just turn on the news today, turn on Fox, if you will, um, and you'll hear some of the same rhetoric. Except that you know the, the language is a little bit different, you know, um, you know, and and, and these language these labels that I that I that I that I shared there are examples of that, right? Because there's things you know, can I pass a policy for ex con that's going to keep them away from schools where he may harm kids? Or can I pass the same policy, um, you know, for someone's granddaughter? One and the same, but we give ourselves permission if it's an ex con or comic, but not if it's somebody's son, father, or, or mother. Uh, nowhere else do we see the com commodification of, of, of convicted people um, you know, and of course, private prisons, right? And 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 I and I did put this note up there, right? No involuntary servitude except for what? Anyone recognize that? Can I get a hand somewhere? Thirteen, what? Because I got some veterans in here. I knew what to say, <laughs> right? But the yeah, right. So we 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 technically outlawed slavery in this country, except for that fine print. You know, it's like that fine point. It's like getting a free trial and you don't turn it off. You're like, wow, I didn't know that it was going to charge me all this money months later. And here it is, you know, here it is all of these years we thought that it is, that slavery was outlawed, or not slavery, sorry, involuntary servitude, right? Choose your language. Um, uh, except for 
those who've been convicted of a crime, right? And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, you know, um, uh, but that does stick out for me a lot, a whole lot, because I'm also a person who worked for 15 cents an hour with no sick pay, no vacation time, no rollover days, no bereavement days, none of that. In fact, if you refuse program in prison, you can get put in solitary. And I don't know if that's, if that's not involuntary servitude, I don't know what, what is. Right, and if you want even further than that, uh, there's a great movie in Netflix, uh, which I'm sure many of you heard, um, uh, 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 13th, which actually kind of outlines how the system has actually morphed and changed and evolved. You know, I mean, it challenges us to think, you know, um, you know, do we need a better system, you know, or do we even need one at all? And how are other societies holding folks accountable without these same kind of uh, 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 settings? And of course, um, I love to read, so I came across of course, Brian Stevenson, which kind of, he, he, he really fleshed out some of this, and this is a quote that I actually have um, on my desk that I think about, but whenever society begins to create policies and laws rooted in fear and anger, there will be abuse and injustice. That is so deep on so many different levels. Um, and I want you guys to check out, because um, nowhere else do you see fear. I mean, you hear fear, right? You, fear, you hear anger, you know, some of the rhetoric, um, and some of us get very passionate about the things that we care about, um, but not many of us get passionate about it to the, at the expense of others. Um, it's as good as it can possibly get. So um, you can easily Google this video, just Google prison auction. Um, and some of it is shocking, right? I want you to guess what it is that they're talking about. Because it's, I mean, there's a lot of things I can do to a product that I can't do to Ron, <laughs> you know? Um, but more importantly, right, like we get the dehumanization part. That's the obvious part. But how can he guarantee a potential customer or investor an endless supply of product through that pipeline? And it's not a coincidence that, you know, a day after um, uh, uh, the current president was elected, that private stock skyrocketed 500%. So if you had a dollar, the day after Trump was elected, that dollar was worth 500. And that's very attractive for a lot of folks, even at the expense of valuing someone's humanity, or even in some cases, right, we're talking about values of contradicting our own values. And how do we balance that? How do we balance compassion and justice with, hey, give me a dollar now, I'll give you $500 later. Or like I mentioned, the other one, humanity with capitalism. I don't know a lot of the answers, um, but, I, but what I do know, <laughs> I like to take a lot of something. Um, and, I, and I think about uh, this young person in, in Indiana, this is Indiana, uh, uh, and he said, you're the first black person I met in real life. You know, and he gave me a hug, and, and I like, you know, and, and when somebody hugs me, I tell you, you know, after being deprived of human contact for a long time, I feel it in my toes. And this young kid was actually like happy, you know, and, and I felt his happiness, you know? But that, that comment resonated with me <laughs> the entire ride home because I'm like, damn, you know, you're 15 years old and this is the first time that you meet a person of color, a black person, in, in, in person, you know? And then I also thought, and then I draw these parallels, these random parallels with how many co officers that I meet have stayed who had never come in contact with a person of color outside of a correctional setting. And what impact did that have in our relations and interacting with each other? No wonder you can't give me an extra trade. No wonder you may fear me if all the information you have for me is based on whatever you get on the screen. In fact, you should fear me. You know, I always think about the time I was flying from Cali to New York where I live at. 
Um, and the woman actually grabbed her purse on my way to the bathroom, 30,000 feet in. <laughs> like, what am I going to do, right? Am I going to just grab your purse and, like, skydive into wherever, right? But this, but this, but this visceral kind of response, without you even knowing who I am or anything about me except anything that you can tell from just, like, looking at me. And I travel just like any other person. Sweatpants, t-shirt, you put the thing on, it's, it's a long ride, you know? Um, so, so that resonated with me, and, and I don't know if it was immediate, but part of the work that I'm doing now, you know, um, at, at the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, is that I'm convinced, just like Brian Stevenson is convinced, that by, because it wasn't until me and Oprah Stevens got to really know each other and talking, that he felt free to, me, free to, to actually engage me. So much so, you know, that he ended up giving me extra trays. Uh, and that's a big thing in prison. You get an extra tray. You're, you're like the man or the woman. You're, you're rocking. You know, um, and had that conversation. So, so how can we expose more people to that young kid in rural Indiana who said, this is the first time I've ever met a, a black person in, in person in real life. You know, um, and, but more importantly, how do we, how do we, you know, build the capacity of those folks who have been solitary survivors, so they have the courage, so they walked away, you know, I'm um, trying to make sense of the harm that's also been done to them um, in a way in which will educate others. And that's not an easy feat, you know? Um, now, I'm truly convinced that, you know, human, humanizing solitary survivors, uh, you know, and, and building a capacity to lead, of course, and also give them the sense of control over their own narratives. And now FISA, who is uh, one of our um, solitary survivors, former incarcerated leader? She is she is amazing out of New Jersey. You know, um, she saw that being transferred into other areas of her life. So her ability to walk inside of a legislative office and say, "Hey, you know, I I was a woman who and and like you can straight Google her and look her story, but I'm a I'm a woman who was held in solitary." What I was expecting, who was strip searched every day, and a lot of these other things, and how that confidence transferred into job interviews and saying, "Hey, you know, this is the salary that I deserve," or being able to communicate in your personal life or with friends, you know. Um, and it's funny because by sharing my story or, or people sharing their stories, we give the listener the opportunity to, to to practice empathy. And I believe that one of the one of the characteristics which truly makes us human is the ability to place in ourselves in other people's shoes and feel what they feel and see what they see and hurt the way that they hurt, but also be happy like the way that they're happy. You know, um, you know, emotions are contagious, you know, um, so, so are perceptions. Um, and I can't tell you how many times I've had talks in afterwards, you know, that mother, who I probably stereotype, right? Because not just one way, I stereotype, we all do. Um, and she's like, hey, like, my son just went through the exact same thing and I have to step back, like, not you. You know, um, uh, but yes, you, right? Because with 2.3 million people who are incarcerated in this country, about about another 100,000 people, you know, in solitary, about another 70 million people with a criminal record on file, right? Or another 15 million people on probation or parole, chances are we're more alike and impacted by a lot of these issues than, 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 than we may think. You know, I would even, I would even argue that uh, most of us in this room you know, um, either uh, have been touched by the system, impacted by the system, or have family members impacted by the system because it's so insidious. And I want to open up for questions in a minute. Um, uh, you know, um, sharing those narratives by amplifying their voices and creating opportunities, you know, for solitary survivors to share their experiences. Um, and this is Felix Colon during Solitary Week. And if you don't know Felix, you're, you, you'll probably be afraid of him. Um, he's rough around the edges, he talks really strong. You know, but if you get to know him, he's like the biggest teddy bear, you know, and and you're actually safer with him than not with him because he's the guy who's going to jump in front of a knife because he's so fearless in a sense. Um, but he also has his own values that he abides by, you know, um, and here it is. He's engaging these young students. Actually, two of them were uh, 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 future FBI agents. And in this case, I took the picture of Felix and saying, uh, why, you, why would you want to arrest your own people? Um, moving forward, oh, can I do it again? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it away. 
Okay, okay, uh, okay, I see it now. Okay, I got it. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we also, um, so in addition to building a capacity of solitary survivors, right, training them to not only tell their stories, but also teaching them about the legislative process, you know, teaching them the politics of politics, <laughs> you know, um, uh, but more importantly, you know, campaign work, community organizing, a lot of things that we're not necessarily naturally inclined to coming out of prison, you know, um, you know, in addition to that, also sharing their narratives and sharing their stories using, you know, technology. We have the virtual reality. And I'll tell you something about the virtual reality is that if you've never been inside of a cell, we try to bring the cell to you so you can actually see, have this immersive experience um, of the sound. And it's very, very engaging in the sense that we've been able to actually mobilize and take these small digital cells, if you will, um, uh, literally across the country to bring the cells to people, to bring the cell to like that young kid. Who, who probably hasn't even never even seen a cell before, anything like that. Recognize that picture, so. <laughs> um, but it's not just working with folks who've been impacted and 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 and, and uh, you know and and their communities. It's also working with the other with the other side. It's also working with corrections, you know. Um, and uh, I actually highlighted a quote by Rick Ramis who. Um, it's one of the correctional leaders that I, I, I respect in this space. Um, he said, can you imagine spending years without, uh, yeah, without having regular social interaction or without full access to human, the basic human activities like showering and exercising? Some boxes you get two showers a day, a week, some you get three showers a week. Um, you know, when did it become okay, right? It sounds like a value question there, right? Uh, to lock up someone who is severely mentally ill and if the demons chase them around, around in the cell. What is wrong with us? I and this he did after he spent time in solitary himself. He put himself in solitary for a day because he said, well, what are the advocates complaining about? This can't be that bad. He didn't finish the entire day. He walks out of his cell saying, we need to release people out of here. And literally walked to every person's cell and said, when was the last person this person received a misbehavior? When was the last time this person received a misbehavior report? If it was more than six months ago, let him out. The concern was that fear of narrative, right? Well, they're gonna kill everyone. What are they gonna do? Say, so, well, if they break the rules, we can always put them back. It's our jail. I don't necessarily agree with that line of thinking, but hey, <laughs> got them out, right? And now Colorado leads the country in the least number of people that's incarcerated in solitary. Because a correctional leader decided to go against the grain of maybe his own staff, maybe, maybe popular opinion, and say, we don't need to have this. And lo and behold, we didn't see an increase in violence happen at all. You know? Um, uh, so it means collaborating with correctional officials. And in that sense, you know, um, uh, along, with, uh, along with Rick Ramis and Craig Haney, who's there, and others, um, I myself, and, and, and I represent NERCAT on the, um, uh, 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 the Safe Alternative Safe, Safe Segregation Initiative out of the Vera Institute of Justice. And it's basically an initiative that connects correctional uh, uh, officials with uh, advocates and tries to find some middle ground around the torture of it. You know, um, there's a, lot, a few other layers there, um, uh, a lot of politics. Um, uh, but it's 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 such a it's such a cross collaborative um, group of folks that you know if there's a conversation that needs to be had in Nevada or something like that you know I feel comfortable reaching out to the commissioner in Nevada based on a lot of relations and say hey can we have this conversation and so on and so forth to try to bridge the gap between the advocates and correctional staff which don't always get along because it kind of seems like they're natural enemies but they actually they actually don't they're actually not. You know, when we look at the fact that correctional officers are also harmed by incarceration, how they have some of the highest alcohol, alcohol, alcoholism rates, highest divorce rates. I'll never forget seeing broken Hennessy bottles on the park on the CO parking lot in Rikers Island. Hey, that's none of my business, but it's there, <laughs> right? Um, and how is that impacting your, your decision making when you're trying to decide whether you should put me in solitary or not? Um, so, so no, we 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 both want the same thing, but the fear and the anger piece does get in the way because it's harm on both sides. Um, and a lot of that, a great example is California. And that also means working with faith leaders. You know, faith leaders, uh, like I told the, um, the majority leader a few hours ago, you know, um, are, are in a unique position to hold our legislators accountable to the, to, the, to, the, to the values that they say they stand for. You know, again, that, to create that cognitive dissonance and one has to change the values that are action. And usually the actions change because values are hard to shape. They're kind of ingrained in us. Um, 
And I tell you, it's been it's been really uh, a great working with face leaders because one of the things that actually kept me going through the time in solitary, and you can imagine I get that question a lot, um, was just really hope. You know, the belief in things yet to be revealed. You know, um, and the hope that I would get out, the hope that I would see my daughter, and so on and so forth. You know, um, which I still try to make sense of to this day. <laughs> okay, uh, I know we're running short on time, and I really did want to leave a whole lot of space open for questions, uh, but it's running a little short. Um, but let's let's not waste time talking about how much time we don't have. And let's talk. <laughs> anyone anyone want to respond, react, hand in the back there? Yeah, um, I liked what you said about the kind of tense and difficult relationship between advocates and correctional staff, mm -hmm. and that's kind of a balance, uh, a line that I balance in my work. We send tutors in to support. Mm -hmm educational classrooms and prisons. Nice. And so we are all, 80 of us here in Philly, are kind of on that line of complacency where we're working against the system but working inside of it. So I just wondered how you navigate that now as an advocate for somebody who goes back into the space that we're trying to work. Yeah, um, it's funny for me being an advocate and also being a formerly incarcerated advocate going inside the space, right? Like sometimes I come in, you know, um, I'll have a, I'll look like a lawyer. <laughs> get treated as such. And then when I start speaking, right, it's hard for me to talk and not talk about the fact that I was away for 13 years of my life. Um, and you literally see the emotional chemistry in the room shift. <laughs> you see that a lot. You know, um, I've never been disrespected or anything like that. But I think that the, the, the friction comes in when security or for, for, for matters of security, a policy is passed when accidents happen that, conflict, that conflicts with, with you as the person who's working in there. And social workers get this a lot, they do a loyalty piece. You know, um, and, 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 and what I always tell people in those cases, I think that any time you're strong on the side of, um, on the side of truth and honesty and when you believe in your heart to be right, you know, um, to stand by that. I think that a lot of the neglect that I saw throughout my incarceration wasn't, um, was it proactive? I mean, don't get. I mean, you get your ribs broken. Um, but a lot of the, a lot of the oppression and neglect that I saw was actually, or a lot of the, the injustice, if you will, came as a result of neglect. You know, not looking at like that. You know, uh, the person who kept walking by his cell, he kept yelling, "I need insulin! I need insulin!" Which I was like, "Why is mentally ill? You don't even know what he's talking about." And finally, one officer went to the sergeant's rank and officer, "Hey, I don't know this guy in eight cells. You might look at him." He said, well, get out of here, don't come back here until it was a body. Two weeks later, Bradley Ballard died, right? And now that sergeant's facing, you know, uh, you know, punitive consequences. But I always wonder what would happen if the soap, because you, if one of the social workers would have said, hey, we need to do something about this or speak up, you know? And, and it's not easy, it, it's really not, you know, it's, it's really not. You know, I yield my privilege as a person who comes in from the outside who, hey, you don't pay me, you know, um, so I'm not restricted by any of that. Um, not that I am, <laughs> but so that and then being and then and then also having my truth as a person who's been formerly incarcerated. I know you're not going to say that that's what I do because I know for a fact that that's not what you do. In fact, I don't even want to talk to you. I'd rather talk to the to the man or to the person who's inside the cell to get the real truth from them. You know, um, and it's not an easy position. You have to challenge outwards and also challenge folks, you know, in internally. And then you this then this. This is going to be battles that you have to choose. You know, Mary Buser, who wrote the book Lockdown on Rikers, had to make that exact decision. Here she is. She is the chief uh, mental health officer in the unit, and she saw so much damage being done. And she said, I cannot, with good conscience, continue in this job. A cognitive dissonance, right? When the actions are so blatant that it conflicts with my, with my values. And yes, I need a paycheck just like anybody else. We have to take care of ourselves. But at what point do I say, you know what? I cannot participate in this at all. You know, um, and, and, and that's a difficult question to answer, you know? Anyone else? Gentlemen in the back there? Oh, <laughs> well, wait, before I get to the song, go ahead. You, sorry, sorry. I, I, you mentioned it several times, but it seems to me that at some point we have to directly confront the issue of punishment, and that punishment and justice cannot coexist, and that our system is a punishment system from the way we make laws to the way police patrol.
control to how they decide who's bad, how they then give them a record, so how school resources, you know, I used to go to detention. Now I would go to jail if, if I were a kid. I mean, you know, and, and at every stage, the, the alliance between prosecutors and judges, the, the nature of prison itself, I mean, it's all a punishment system. Yeah. It, so, um, yes, a thousand times, you know, and, and I think that we're conscious of that, you know, and, and because we have such, such a punitive paradigm, right, we're also in a space where we, we've criminalized mental health, right. we've criminalized homelessness. I mean, I, I worked in, I worked direct services for three and a half years. I could tell you how many clients I had with $250 fines when they fell asleep on a park bench. Newsflash, if I'm sleeping on a park bench, you're not getting 250 <laughs> right? So, like, even just how backwards that is, right? We, you know, we, we, you know, we, we, we perpetually criminalize people. You know, we say, hey, like, you know, you, you, like, hey, you did your time, but then in society, we remind them every sense. You know, these invisible fences. You know, I was on parole for five years. You know, where I literally couldn't fraternize with anyone who has a felony. But what happens when the entire family has a felony? What do I do about it? Right. Um, so, 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 yeah, and I think that the answer, the answer is not necessarily, I'll say the answer to the end, because I think, I think it, the, I think that what you bring it up is a question more of values and not necessarily of what policy. I think that, I think that once the culture changes, policies are followed in a lot of different ways. And, you know, uh, one of the fascinating things that I saw with a lot of recent changes around same-sex marriage is that you saw this cultural change shift a whole lot earlier on, you see it in the TV or some TV shows, you know, so on and so forth. You do see like that cultural shift before you actually saw the, the, the policies path. Not that there wasn't any struggle, but when you look at throughout history, you see a number of different things, at least in movements throughout the last hundred years. You see people who were directly impacted leading that movement, saying, hey, I know what this looks like and I know what, I know what harm looks like and I know what justice and restoration <laughs> looks like, you know? And then you also, you know, see, you know, um, uh, uh, yeah, you see formerly incarcerated leadership, and then you also see that culture change. Like, what needs to happen for us to change culturally and internally in order for us to actually pass the policy that we want to see? So when this question comes up about make the case for solitary, I can come up here and tell you all the statistics in the world and convince you that this is it, but you won't leave changed. So my question to you is not how do we get rid of solitary, but how do we change people? Right? How do we change people? And that's a deep question that I do not have the answer to. It almost brings tears to my eyes. I do not know how, how to do that because I fundamentally think that we're not going to get to a place in this, in this world where we don't have that punitive paradigm, right? Where we, where we do see the capacity of people and, and the capacity for them to become the best version of themselves um, if, if we don't make those internal changes, right? I've met funders who fund work around homelessness but we'll get on the train and not get this guy a dollar. <laughs> Think about it, right? This came about $100,000 to work on this issue. But you get on the train, and this person comes up to you with a cup, and you say, ah, I ain't got it. Right? It, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. So the question is, how can we become better people? Or better yet, how can we behave as better people? Or how can we, how can we catalyze that in ourselves? How can we catalyze it within our families? Because we all got that one family member. I know I got one or two. You know, so oh, that's kind of backwards, Jim. That's kind of backwards, Johnny, or you know, whatever name for the blank, right? Um, and how do we how how do we do that? You know, um, and, and that's and that's a, that's a question that that's going to take a lot of work and challenging, and it's not easy. It takes uncomfortable conversations. You know, like many of you are not going to disagree with me with a lot of things that I say may challenge me a little bit, but it's not really hostile here. You know, some like we kind of get the punitive paradigm, so and so forth. It's gonna take conversations about racism, race, conversations about white privilege, yes. conversations about wealth and inequity, yes. but more importantly, conversations about privilege and how we leverage that privilege. You know what yes. I mean? Yes. Someone called me, someone said, Johnny, you're very privileged. You don't know how privileged you are, right? You're traveling the country, you got a good job, you got shoes on your feet. And at, and at, the, at the time, I actually got offended. How dare you? I've been 13 years in prison, I'm a black man in society. 
I got to put my camera on if I get pulled over. How dare you say I have privilege? And part of having privilege is that you sometimes don't know you have it. <laughs> 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 Lo and behold, you don't know what you don't know. So of course I'm going to be defensive in some senses, right? But then the larger question was, now that I know that I have it, what's the next question? So you say, what do I do with it? So I realized that, you know, one of the true markings of a leader is to build other leaders and to create space for other people to step in. Yeah. You know, and uh, there's some folks, I said, I hope that I can handle on that. There's some folks here specifically from Pennsylvania working on this exact issue. You know, um, Chris, can you put your hand up real quick? <laughs> yeah. And you already spoke, so I'm not like outing anyone who's working on these issues. Salim is another brother who I actually look up to here in Pennsylvania who are leading these fights who, who you know, and I admire Salim, actually specifically, I'm going to put you in spot. Um, but Salim, uh, and I believe you've been, probably, he, he was organizing on the inside long before starting organizing on the inside, on the, on the outside, and know in the unique perspectives of that, you know? Um, and, and it's not until we can recognize our privilege, leverage it, to amplify the voices of those who've been most harmed, to change the, mind, the hearts and minds of those around us who may even not know that they also themselves have privilege, you know? And then the other thing, the last thing that I always tell people is that you can get in spaces that I can't, you know? So, so take me with you, you know? In your heart, in your, in your, in your minds, in, in your, and some of your feedback to people, hey, you know, I heard this guy, Tommy, he can make a whole lot of sense, but he did say this one thing that made sense to me, you know? And if, and if you're able to do that, then you carry my message to them. Um, because sometimes it's not the message for who, right? The messenger, you know? Um, hence how I try to tell Corrections, hey, you want to fix gang problems? Hire former gang members, but they won't listen to me. Um, but just, you know, just this reaction to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the punitive piece, you know? I think we have time for one more question, and then I'll, I'll hang out a little bit, and folks can, can ask questions, but I'm going to be respectful of people's time. Can we take just one more? The profiteering of the private prisons. Yeah. What can we do to, to counter that? It feels like something that I like, don't have any control over, but is it like. Oh, you do. You have a whole lot of control over it. Yeah. Um, well, one, uh, okay, pop quiz. Do you know what all you put in your promo case were? Right? Not you specifically, but a lot of us, right? We have promo case. Do we know where these funds actually go? You know, or when they invest in mutual funds, then we know mutual funds are group of other stocks. Where are these mutual funds coming from? Right? So that's a question to definitely ask your employer because you don't want to inadvertently be supporting close prisons with your retirement dollars. Wow. Right? Some say, hey, well, if they go up 500%, now that actually is, I've heard that, you know? Um, so that's one question. And then also another question is that you'll be surprised how many products are made by men, women, and men, women who are incarcerated. You know, and how many services you use. You may pick up the phone to find out that your telemarketer is actually a person who's incarcerated. It's probably chained to his desk. You know? Um, so I'm asking those questions. But I think the larger piece is that there's a legislator right now, somewhere in some office, saying that you want something you don't. Because we lack the capacity to be able to engage this legislator and say, hey, you're my legislator. I want to be able to come in and talk about exactly what it is that you care about. Make sure that you're representing my concerns. Where do you stand on this issue? Where do you stand on that issue? And I'm hopeful because it feels like we're in a place in our country where, where people have to respond to that. You know, I, I look at Twitter every now and then in a conversation about should incarcerated people vote. Huge topic, right? And then, I'm not gonna say it's even, I don't know what that looks like. You can obviously know where I stand on that issue. Um, because I believe that everyone should have the right to vote. Um, but it's we're in a place where presidential candidates have to respond to that. Mainly because the community is held them accountable. To, to the degree in which we can do that, of course. And they always say, don't be a victim, we will support the work. Nonprofit work does not get done on its own. You know, um, that's just the reality, the truth of it. You know, um, I wish we had a government that said, hey, we also need social justice issues and things like that, but we actually see it stripped away in a whole bunch of different spaces, especially when we're talking about conditions work. Nobody cares about the people inside. Well, they're all right. Let's keep them from going in and keep them from going back. But what do we do with the 95% or so that are out there now? You know? Um, so, yeah. Last closing thought. Uh, um, I'm going to put uh, like my contact information there, uh, uh, our website, um, social media. 
um, and, and two important websites, Solitary Watch, which if you don't know, you should totally check out. I mean, the unlock the box now .org, um, website I put up there because it's a fairly new national campaign to end solitary um, in 20 years. Uh, excuse me, by by the by, the, uh, by uh, by 2030. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, and if 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 something that I said, of course, definitely. Hit, like take it with you. You know, if you disagree with something, something that doesn't make sense, that's completely fine. You can also leave it here, or you can email me about it, um, and we can have a larger conversation. I'm totally always happy happy to do that. You know, um, you know, but more importantly, you know, I think that the the, the question that I really want y'all to take away from all of this is really asking yourself the question about who am I? What do I value? You know, um, and if so, do these policies reflect that? And if not, to act. You know. Um, I don't care how eloquent I can be and so on and so forth, you do not feel compelled to act. So I was hoping to create cognitive dissonance tonight and get you to change either your behaviors or even your values. Um, uh, thank you so much.